Uh, Psalms 121. Three things that we're going to find in Psalms 121. Three things that we're going to draw from it. Number one, the power of the eyes. Number two, the purpose of adversity. And number three, the covering of God. Three things we're going to pull out of it. The power of the eyes, the purpose of adversity, and the covering of God. We're going to pray, and then, uh, then we'll look at Scripture. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. Um, God, I ask that you would dominate this time for your glory in the name of Jesus. Uh, God, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Please, uh, even in this moment, God, I ask that you would wash away our sins and, and, and forgive us of anything that we have done, God, that doesn't please you. Uh, God, we don't want anything to stand in the way of you dominating this time. We don't want anything to stand in the way of you speaking to our hearts. Uh, and so we ask that you would do that now and, uh, again, speak to us, God, from your word. Uh, we, we really need to hear from you, Father. Uh, we humble ourselves to you and to what you have to say. Uh, we promise, God, that when we hear your word, we won't just be entertained by it. We won't stop there. Uh, we'll take that extra step and be doers of the word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Psalms 121, like I said, through May and June, we're going to walk through different psalms. Today, uh, we're going to be in Psalms 121. And it reads as this, I lift up mine eyes into the hills. Uh, where does my help, where does my help come? Answers his own question. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Verse 2. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Let's go back to verse 1. We're going to look at it. It says, I will lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Uh, the first thing I want to notice and draw out of Psalm 121 is the power of the eyes. The power of the eyes. How crazy is it that making it through trouble is that simple? How crazy is it that getting through hard times is that simple? That you don't have to be that smart, you don't have to be that savvy, that to make it through hard times, the writer is letting us know, God is letting us know, that all we have to do is keep our eyes on God. It is truly that simple. He says, look to the hills. I want to bring to your attention that he doesn't say move the hill. I want to bring to your attention that he doesn't say climb the hill. That all we have to do, it's really that simple. That too, to make it through tough times, to make it through, and we have been, we have seen tough times over the last year and a half, that to make it through adversity, all I have to do is keep my eyes on Jesus. And that really is all we have to do. That really is all God is calling us to do. Yet at times, it seems like the hardest thing to do. Jesus is standing there in the middle of your adversity. In the middle of your adversity, while the fire is the hottest. And he's saying one thing over and over. Look at me. Yelling out to his people, hey, look at me. Twenty years from now, if you were to look back at your life and you have found that you have lost in parenting, 20 years from now, if you look back at your marriage and find out that you, you have lost in marriage, 20 years from now, if you, if you fail to glorify God and please God with your life, I want you to know it will not be if you fail by God's standards, that is. If you fail by God's standards, it will not be because of your finances or lack thereof. It will not be because your political party didn't overcome the other one. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter which political party you root for. You lose in life by God's standards. It won't be, it won't be because the Democrats couldn't get the majority of the votes in, 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 in the Senate. 
with the Congress or because the Republicans couldn't do the same. It won't be because of your ability or lack thereof. It will be because one thing, there was one thing that you refused to do. You refused to keep your eyes on Jesus. More marriages have gone bad because of someone not keeping their eyes on Jesus than finances. I have seen more families spoiled and rotten to the core. Not because of finances, not because they couldn't figure it out, but because someone couldn't keep their eyes on Jesus. And so we, we learn from Peter's lesson in Matthew 14. Peter actually goes to walk on water. He goes, Peter did the impossible, one of my favorite passages in Scripture. People talk about how Jesus walked on water. That's pretty cool, but he is Jesus. Peter walks on water. Jesus stands out on the water. He says, Master, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus says, come on. And because, not because he was so special, but because Jesus said he could do it, Peter starts to walk on water. And he does not start to sink because he is human. He does not start to sink because he weighed in excess of 160 pounds. No, no, no. He doesn't. He sinks. Peter starts to sink. Yes, because he took his eyes off Jesus. In life, see, you're going to sink or swim. Matthew 14 is a lesson of that. In life, every single person in this room will sink or swim. And whether you sink or swim, no matter who you are, no matter what background you have, no matter where you came from, no matter whether you're a Republican or Democrat or independent, no matter whether you're black or white or Hispanic, if you sink or swim in life, it will be because you took your eyes off Jesus. It is the hardest thing to do sometimes, to keep our eyes on Jesus. It's why Hebrews 12 and 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This idea that we should fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, the writer of Hebrews, when it says to fix our eyes on Jesus, it's this idea that I would put my eye on Jesus and not move it. That I would put my eyes on Jesus and not move it. It actually means that I would disregard everything else and have my eyes on him. Did you know that the measure of Christian maturity is your ability through the ups and downs of life to keep your eyes on Jesus? And that your, your relationship with God can be judged, the maturity of your relationship with God can be judged by your ability to lock in on Jesus and not look around. Jesus is saying, look at me. Look at me. And it's like, God, I, 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 I want to look at you, but, but Jesus is here, and he's saying, look at me. And you're like, God, yeah, but, but the election. Jesus is saying, look at me, and it's like, yeah, God, but, but the pandemic. And Jesus is saying, look at me. It really is that simple. Did you know that the devil can't even, he can't take you down? He can't defeat you? He can't overcome you? That his, his method of trying to defeat you is to distract you? That the devil at his best, when he is functioning at his most powerful, when he is at his most powerful, he is the world's biggest clown. And all he does is try to dance and move his hands. And all he's trying to do, I'm sorry if I didn't do that again. All he's trying to do is distract you. He has one, one mission in mind from the time that you wake up until the time that you go to sleep. There's only one thing. It's real simple. One thing he's trying to accomplish, he's trying to get you to take your eyes off Jesus. That is why you had trouble with the transmission. That is why the kids are acting a fool. 
That is why your boss won't leave you alone. It's just about one thing and one thing only. And anything he can do to accomplish that is a win in his book. So for some of you, it's not enough money. That if you don't have enough money, your eyes come off Jesus. For some of you, it's too much money. That you get a little too comfortable in your eyes, you start to come off Jesus. And for all of us, it's different. And the crazy thing is, for every single person sitting here, he knows what your thing is. He knows what it takes. For some of you, it's cars. For some of you, it's Clemson football or Carolina football. God help you if it's Carolina football. <laughs> if, if you're going to take your eyes off Jesus, at least look at a winner. <laughs> man, oh man. I mean, I'm, I'm neutral, but gosh. And for every single one of you, if I were to go down the road and I would say, Devil, Tessa, Devil, Doreen, and I'd just go down the road and he would say, Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. And he, if I got him to call out your, he knows what it is. That thing. That it, people, people think that we get, we get so caught up in sin. We think that the devil wants you to sin. Check this. Sin isn't at its core, sin isn't lusting, lying, envy. It's whatever action happens next after you take your eyes off Jesus. People get so caught up in sin. It, it doesn't have to be sin. If he can get you to take your eyes off Jesus, yes, if sin works, then yes, he'll use sin. But the Bible says, let us lay aside, thank you, Lord, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. In other words, it doesn't have to be sin. And some of you think that because your hang-up isn't sin, then you're better than the person whose hang-up is pornography. You don't have to say amen. You, you think that because your hang-up, that, that because your hang-up is your job and you're working 70 hours a week, that your job is keeping you from reading your Bible, you think that you're better than the person whose hang-up is anger? And I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter. And if, and if he can let you put your guard down by it not being something that's sin, he'd rather do that. At least, at least if it's not sin, you'll feel good about it and you'll never repent. His soul mission, one thing. He doesn't care how he does it. He doesn't care what it takes. He wants you to take your eyes off Jesus. And Hebrews 12 and 20, Hebrews 12 and 2 says, put your eyes on Jesus and don't move it. Again, sin is not lying and lust. Sin is whatever happens after you take your eyes off Jesus. Sin is the, the step that you take when your eyes are not on him. Sin is the decision you make when your eyes are not on him. Sin is the job that you accept when your eyes are not on him. Sin is the relationship you get into. I'm looking right at you, my niece. Sin is, the, <laughs> sin is the relationship you get into when your eyes are not on him. The Bible says, my, my, my good friend Janet texted me a verse earlier. Uh, what was that, 105 and 19 or 119, 105? 105. Um, no matter though. It's, uh, but the verse says this that his word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. His word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. That God wants to be an integral part of where you are, the decisions that you make for where you are and for where you're going. And if I am, get this, he's a light into my feet and a light into my path. Now, if I take my eyes off him, I am taking my eyes off the lamp. I am taking my eyes off the light. And so to, to, to take my eyes off the light and to make decisions and make moves not being in the light, it is the definition of walking in darkness. 
It's not about sin. It's just moving outside of his will. That I would not pray and make a decision. That I would, that I would take my eyes off him and accept this job or move to this city. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah is guilty of sin not because he lusts or because he has pride, but because he takes his eyes off Jesus and he goes, he goes this way. That's all he did. He didn't kill anybody. <laughs> he didn't steal from anybody. He took his eyes off Jesus and he went this way. And he, and he was guilty of sin. Sin is whatever you do, whatever step you take, whatever decision you make when your eyes are not on him. James 1 and 4 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Uh, James is explaining to us how temptation works. When, when the devil is trying to tempt you, he doesn't tempt you by throwing this at you. It's this idea, you think of luring, if, if you've ever fished, that, that lure baits in the water, and that the fish is caught not when he puts his mouth on the hook. The fish is caught when that bait or whatever it is goes by, and he does this. Whenever he puts his eyes on it, he's done. That is why Jesus says that when you do that, you've already committed adultery. Oh, I haven't slept with anybody. Big deal. You take your eyes off Jesus and you're locked in on a person. You take your eyes off Jesus and you have your eyes on this and that. You've sinned already. Purpose of adversity. I'm going to move through this. Purpose of adversity. Uh, one and two. Let's, let's go back to one. Go back to one. I'm going to be real quick. He says, I, lift, I want you to look at the tense. Uh, we, we, we read through this and I, I really want you to notice the tense. Uh, for those of you, I'm talking about first, the writer goes from first to second tense. Now, for those of you that didn't pay attention in English, what I'm talking about in first tense is that he's saying I. I, me, that's first tense. Second tense is when he's saying you. Okay? So the writer says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He's talking about himself and his own struggle. Verse 2. He will not... Uh, he goes on from that and he says... Now he goes from talking about himself and his own struggle to saying, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he keeps Israel who neither slumber nor sleep. Keep going. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. He starts off uh, encouraging himself and talking about his own struggle and saying, I have to keep my eyes on the Lord. And then he moves on that, moves on from that and says, hey, God's going to take care of you. This is the process by which we are used by God. First, verses 1 and 2, God takes you through something. Okay, then following that and always following that, he will use what you have been through to be a blessing to somebody else. The writer is not talking about himself the whole time. He, he, he shows us the process of Christian maturity. Number one, it is not all about you. Some of us live our whole lives in verse one and two. Oh, God's going to help me. God's going to bless me. I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes. I'm going to keep my eyes on the hills from where comes my help. And that's your whole life. Oh, God's going to, he's going to help me. He's going to bless me. God help me to do what I need to do. And you never move on to say, hey, let me tell you something, brother. He's not going to let your foot be moved. The one who keeps Israel, he doesn't slumber, he doesn't sleep. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. You see, the purpose of what we go through, I'm going to answer an age-old question maybe, that, that I've heard a thousand people ask me in 20 years of ministry. Why did that happen to me? I've had black, white, young, old ask me the same question, 
Why did I go through that? Why did that happen to me? Why did I lose that loved one? Why did I lose that job? Why did I have to go through that? And the answer is in 2 Corinthians 1 and 4. It says, it lets us know that Christ who comforts us in all our troubles. Why does God comfort you? When it says comfort, it means that he, he brings you through your troubles. He delivers you out of your troubles. Why does he do it? Because he likes you? Because you're his favorite? Because you're number one on his list? Because of how much you pray? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, because of how much you read your Bible. No, no, no. None of those is true. That he comforts you in your trouble. He delivers you so that we can comfort those in any trouble. With the same comfort we ourselves received from God. In other words, the same thing that got you out can get somebody else out. The same, the same prayer, that same method of prayer that, that saved you, that helped you, it can save somebody else. That you went through, maybe you went through trouble in your marriage. Not maybe. You went through trouble in your marriage so that you could help somebody else who's having trouble in their marriage. That you experienced sickness or disease so that you would be able to, to help someone who's experiencing sickness or disease. Because when, somebody, when somebody's going through trouble, you saying that a holiday is a special it really isn't going to go very far. God needs you not to know uh, there is a certain education that God wishes to give you. And that education doesn't come from going to seminary. That education doesn't come from uh, going to school. That education comes from going through trouble and trial. And the Bible lets us know that God will take you through a certain type of trouble. Even your trouble's not random. Even your trial isn't random, that God would take you in a certain direction through a certain trouble and have a certain type of storm hit your life so that when you come out of the storm, you can say, hey, the Lord is your keeper. I went through... Uh, 15 years ago, I'm sitting on Broad River Road in a dark apartment. Uh, there's an eviction notice on the door. It's a, it's a studio apartment. I'll never forget it. It's a studio apartment. Uh, the lights are off, and not because I didn't want to go over to the switch. The lights are off because uh, SCNG cut them off. Um, I had lost my job. My car was repossessed. The water's off, and I have a half a pack of oatmeal cookies sitting on the counter. That is all the food that is in the apartment, and my bank account's in the, in the negative. I went, uh, rent on Broader Road can be extremely cheap in, in certain pockets. And where I was at, the rent was about $400. Yes, $400. That's including everything. They'll throw it all in if you just move in. Um, and so the only, the only uh, backdrop to that, the only withdrawal to that is that I'm watching drug deals happen on a daily basis. And I remember I'm going, I, I remember I got so down, I'm sitting in there with a half pack of oatmeal cookies and I'm, I'm trying to ration oatmeal cookies. Uh, finally, I get up, open the door, I walk across the little street to where some drug dealers are, I know I just, you know, these guys never went to work, so I, 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 knew, I knew their occupation. So I asked them, could I borrow their gun? They said, okay. I said, does it work? He showed me that it works. I'm not going to tell you how he showed me. He showed me that it works. He gave it to me. I took the gun, went back to the apartment, sat down on the little couch, and I looked at it, and I put it in my mouth, and I pulled the trigger. And... Obviously, I'm here because God jammed it, and he wouldn't allow it to work. And I didn't realize why God would allow me to go through that. I didn't know why God would allow me to get in a situation that was so dark and so distraught 
where I saw no light at the end of the tunnel um, and thought that the only way out was to take my life. I didn't know why until, that was 15 years ago, I didn't know why until four years ago, I'm the pastor of Radius White Knoll, I am sitting in across from a young lady uh, named Margot. And Margot, the night before, made an attempt on her life. And I am explaining to Margot And the Lord is your keeper. He's your shade. And I talked to Margot two weeks ago, and she's, she's doing really good. She has a daughter, um, and she's walking with the Lord. I didn't know why God would allow me to go through what I went through until I was sitting across from Margot. And everything I had gone through made sense, perfect sense. And for every single person in this room, you have a Margot. And you may be questioning why you went through what you went through. You may be questioning, even, even if you're like me, you're questioning God's goodness. You're questioning whether God loves you or not. And I want to let you know, not only does he love you, but he really loves Margot too. And he's going to use what you went through to help Margot. I'm going to say it like this. The price you pay as you go through adversity will be gas money for someone else as they go through the same thing. The fee, the fee, the toll that you pay as you go through adversity is Margot's gas money as she goes through the same thing. And every person in this room has a Margot. To be truthful, I would actually say that you have multiple Margos. And God needs you to go through what you're going through. The last thing we see in Psalms 121 is the covering of God. Verse 5 and 6. We're going, we're going in with this. Can we go back to verse 5? If not, I can. Okay, there it is. It says, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. That is a powerful statement. God is saying that as you go through trouble, we're going to end with this on a high note. As you go through trouble and you go through the adversity that you go through, God is saying, I'm your shade. Now, in New York City, that might not be a word from the Lord. <laughs> and, and, and north of of of, of you leave the south, you go to the north, that might not be a powerful word from the Lord, but in South Carolina, the capital of heat, that is a word from the Lord. God is saying, I'll, I'll be your shade. When you go through trouble, I'm your shade. Um, do we have that umbrella? God is saying, when you go through trouble, I'm your shade. Um, how many would say, I do want you to know, now shade is a very powerful thing. Uh, for most, I can't speak for, 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 for white people. I would, uh, we're going to do a lot of that, so if that makes you uncomfortable, <laughs> this, need, this needs to be your last Sunday, <laughs> okay? Please don't come back. We're going to do a lot of that. We're going to pick on each other, we're going to have some fun, and we're going to do it all in the name of Jesus, <laughs> okay? Because we all, we all are messed up. Um, but seriously speaking, kind of, for black people, I would say on a really hot day, on a really hot day, let's say you've been in 100 degree weather all day and you're out in the sun, I'd rather have five minutes of shade than five ounces of And that would be, that would be, I'd rather have five minutes of shade. I'd rather have some shade for five minutes 
than have five minutes of water and have the sun still beating down on the back of my neck. And, and the sweat going right there. I, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather have five minutes of shade. Shade is a very powerful thing. And so God says, as you go through, I will be your shade. Uh, raise your hand if the last year, year and a half, was one of the roughest of your life. One of, the, one, of, one of the most challenging of your life, the last year, year and a half. I would say most people, and that's most people, uh, I would say for most people that would be the case. That was, I would say for all of us, it, it's probably in your top, top five most challenging years. Um, what if I told you, as challenging as it was, that you spent all of 2000 this would happen. This would happen. I, t I told you guys not to get a dollar store umbrella. These get the real deal. You get, you get umbrellas off Amazon, not, not the dollar store. As challenging as 2020 was, what if I told you that you spent all of 2020 in the shade? And you may say, well, pastor, it was hot. You spent the whole year in the shade. Pastor, it was challenging. It was, it was one of the roughest years of my life. You spent the whole year in the shade. The verse says, the Lord is the keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The, the sun shall not, it will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Now, that is powerful because if God God I would just take protection from the sun because the moon I'll kick the moon's butt the, the moon the moon's not going to give me dry mouth but the, but the sun but that's the goodness of the Lord that I'll protect you even when you don't even need it he doesn't say it won't get hot he says I'll cover you I'll be your shit I'll cover you he doesn't promise that you won't go through trouble he says I'll cover you he doesn't promise that life won't get challenging. He doesn't promise that you won't lose your job. He says, when you do lose your job, I'll cover you. He doesn't promise that, that everything will be hunky-dory in your life. What he does promise is that he'll cover you. And going back to the beginning of the sermon to end it, the devil doesn't want you to look up. Because if you look up, you'll realize that this whole time he's had my back. This whole time he's been covering me. This whole time when I thought he abandoned me, if I look up, I realize, oh my gosh, you've been with me the whole time. And so the devil doesn't want you to do this. Because if you do that, if you do that, you have to repent. If you do that, you have to, you have to fall on your knees and say, God, like I did a, a couple weeks ago, and say, God, I'm sorry. I got a few raindrops on my feet, and, and little did I know, it wouldn't have been nothing compared to had he taken the shade away. You thought 2020 was bad? What if he would have taken his shade away? You thought some raindrops fell on you in your life? That's, that's nothing if, if, the, if the God of the universe would take his shade away. And that is why the Bible says that we, we praise even in trouble. Because we know that the whole time He's got me covered. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your covering. I thank you for your promises. I, 2020 was such a rough year for a lot of people. But God, we, we know that you never leave your people. We know that you will never leave us or forsake us. God, you had us covered. You mean you had us covered the whole time? Thank you so much, God. I'm sorry for ever thinking that you didn't have my back. I'm sorry for ever thinking that you didn't love me. I'm sorry for ever thinking that you would left my side. All I had to do was look up. We ask you to be with us as we worship. God, in Jesus' name, amen.